Let's do a quick breakdown on Triteris stock. The ticker is TRIT stock. So Triteris has gone public via a SPAC. It previously traded under the name Netfin Acquisition Corp or Netfin. The ticker then was NFIN. So what is Triteris? So Triteris is this hyper growth platform to enable global commodity trading or being able to send goods from one country to the next but focusing on subscale loans for commodity traders. We'll get into all this in a few minutes. I wanted to do a quick overview of the companies of the companies for viewers that don't have the time to go through the full video. Management thinks they're tapping into this huge enormous opportunity where trade finance for these subscale loans is 1.5 trillion dollar opportunity. So potential huge growth runway in the years ahead, and they think they're disrupting this market, providing a solution because they're using a distributed ledger through Ethereum or Bitcoin, um, block, excuse me, not Bitcoin, blockchain, to revolutionize trade finance. And so management indicates that Triteris is extremely profitable, growing at nearly 200% and very profitable, as I just mentioned. So while Triteris seems like it's incredibly interesting, like how many companies are growing at 200%, and are profitable tapping into this $1.5 trillion opportunity, there are some red flags that give me pause. And I'm not sure if this is appropriate for my personal financial journey. This video goes out to Arjun, who's in a, an Unrivaled Investing Journey subscriber. And let, let, let's do a quick 10 second plug about that. So my name is Daniel, you're watching Unrivaled Investing. This is a no hype mission focused channel to try to find you exceptional companies and unrivaled investments. If you enjoy trying to learn or find potential multi-baggers, the stocks that can go up hundreds or thousands of percent, make sure you subscribe. If you're already a subscriber, please hit that thumbs up. And if you want to follow my personal journey to try to find potential multi-baggers, go to unrivaledinvesting.com. Click on Journey. So let's learn a bit about Triterrace. So let's 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 first figure out like what problem is Tri Triterrace trying to address? And it's all about trading commodities, moving commodities from one country to another. And so physical commodities are bought and sold like wheat and food oils, internationally shipped across seas. It can take months for, for items to go from one place to the other and dealing with payments. That's tricky when you have someone that's expecting to get paid and they need to pay their farmers or you have a buyer that's expecting to pay buy goods and they don't necessarily want to put up the cash up front. So you have this sort of logistics challenge of securing payment as early as possible for the seller. And for the buyer, you're like, well, wait a second, if I'm gonna put up this money to buy this wheat, am I actually getting good wheat? Or am I getting the, the appropriate oils that I'm expecting? This is not a petroleum based platform, this is other food oils. But you know, like, so, so the buyer has this issue of like, well, let's defer payment as late as possible. I wanna make sure we're getting exactly what we want. And so you have commodity tra traders that effectively step into here to help link up the buyers and sellers, deal with their pain point of, you know, ones wanting cash as soon as possible, ones wanting to delay payment as late as possible. The commodities trader arranges all the shipping, the logistics, moving goods from one country to the next, dealing with customs, dealing with the infrastructure, the ports, and they solve this sort of two-sided problem of trade finance. So then the question is, where do these commodities traders get their financing. And that's the trade finance industry. Trades need liquidity. And this is a huge industry. This is a $40 trillion marketplace um, where it's, but it, but it's primarily done by big players, players where you're putting up hundreds of millions of dollars of wheat, if not billions of dollars for certain commodities. And when you're a big player, you can get a big loan. You can get banks um, effectively, you know, saying, hey, you're good for it. We'll provide a letter of credit. And so that's usually what happens. But when you're a smaller player, let's say a sub $10 million loan, that's a lot trickier. Does the bank want to do that? It's still it's still the same cost for the bank to, to do that loan. And so you, you sort of get this problem of trade finance, which takes months, you know, in, in terms of the whole completion of the process. Um, and, you know, you, either you're a trader where you have cash on your balance sheet, you're big enough where a bank's willing to vouch for you, or what else? What's your options? And so that's that's sort of the tricky part here. And you have this subscale segment where let's say sub $10 million loans really aren't being addressed by the marketplace because for bankers, it's really not in their interest to get into the space. Why? Because it involves dozens of parties 
and underwriting a $10 million loan has much of the same cost, much of the same fixed cost as let's say writing a $100 million loan. So 10 million versus 100 versus $200 million, your costs are gonna be the same. So doing the smaller loan isn't as worthwhile for you. And look at all of these different counterparties that you're potentially dealing with. You're looking at freight forwarders, pre-shipment inspectors, export terminal, export customs, export bank, the interbank, the correspondent bank, the invoicing courier, you gotta make sure they get the invoice, document courier, then once again, invoicing terminal, uh, when, when they receive it, the import customs, the shipper. There are so many different parties here where something could get screwed up or an additional friction that it's almost not worth it for banks to get into this sort of subscale loan market for trade finance. And so that's the core challenge. And not only is it is it sort of small, but you, you have natural challenges with the tr traditional trade financing route where you have like, look, documents are man manually handled, resulting in high risk and operational complexity due to human error. Um, manufacture your fraud susceptibility where manufactured goods have very lenient supervision and paper documents can be altered throughout the supply chain. So as it goes along that messy supply chain you just saw, like things can get screwed up along the way. You have physical products require critical uh, quality assurance. You know, that the quality assurance of the products, that's gonna need to get reviewed no matter what. Um, so your $10 million loan versus $100 million loan, that, you know, you're still gonna have to have someone review the quality of the, the end goods that are being sent. You know, purchasers utilize credible mediators like brokers, private investigators, uh, arbitrators, which increase the transaction cost. So you see all these things that sort of make it harder to do subscale financing for commodities traders. And here is where Triteris enters. Here's their core value proposition, where it's the, one of the world's first large scale blockchain enabled trade and trade finance platforms for commodities. And they talk about how for lenders, historically trade finance loans have been slow, paper intensive and complex multi-step processes, susceptible to document errors and fraud and have required a high amount of fixed overhead expenses, regardless of the size of the loan. Smaller size loans below $10 million were not as profitable because of these high fixed expenses. By utilizing technology to digitize documents, mitigate documentation error and fraud, as well as increase transaction speed, Kratos lowers the administrative costs for lenders and makes lending in this segment profitable. So that's, that's a key change saying, look, previously it's not profitable for the lenders, now it can be. For traders as borrowers, it allows greater access to trade finance, which is often uh, referenced as a key barrier for traders. Also for traders, our platform offers significantly lower financing sourcing costs than traditional options. Our 1.3% financing source fee is notably lower than current offline market rates for capital sourcing, which we believe is generally closer to 2% to 2 two and a quarter. So A, they're also saying not only are we making this segment profitable, but our cost structure is lower um, for those looking to get a, a, a financing. Additionally, the platform provides lenders with a community of pre-qualified trade finance borrowers with their KYC or Know Their Customer or AML anti-money laundering and financial information uploaded to the platform giving potential trade finance providers the confidence to transact in the ecosystem, i.e. they're making it easier for the lenders to get onto the platform. Our business focuses on transactions with the total value of traded goods below $10 million, as we believe large transactions in excess of 50 million attracts banks to offer trade finance, i.e. if you're a big boy, that's you're, you're doing the $100 million commodities trades, you, the banks are already all over you, they're doing a letter of credit. Our average transaction size since launch through August 2020 has been one has been a little under $2 million. That's a really interesting point. Let's think about that a little bit later when we're talking about their growth and diversifying their revenue sources. So they're enabling a segment that wasn't profitable before. They keep going where they say traditional trade and trade finance processes that rely on paper trails are costly, lengthy, lengthy, inefficient, paper intensive, and subject to fraud. The blockchain technology utilized by Kratos digitizes and streamlines the entire life cycle of the commodity transaction process, including documentation. Transactions executed on Kratos are significantly faster, more efficient, and secure, as all data and activity is timestamped, chronologically stored in blocks, reducing the risk of data modification or tampering. The underlying process and architecture also provides users with more robust and secure reporting. Collectively for traders, this helps resolve counterparty trust issues, another significant problem in the industry, and boosts financial performance by reducing trade cycle times, thus driving higher revenue. So 
you're looking at a platform. So you have Triteras, and they launched the Kratos blockchain for trade finance, particularly focused on sub $10 million financing. That's enabling a segment that wasn't profitable before. Now it can be, it's cheaper and faster to make these loans. They're enabling the banks to get the core information they need because ideally it's on blockchain. It's easier to track who they're dealing with. When I'm looking at this, at least on a high level perspective, I like what I'm smelling. Like this suggests A, they're tapping into this huge opportunity, which means you're looking at high growth rates for years at a time. And it also smells like they have an unrivaled value proposition, what they're offering versus existing market solutions. So what do their financials look like? And what managements are, are penciling out are incredible financials where, you know, previously they were at 16, 17 million in revenue in fiscal 2019. Now they're penciling out 57 million in revenue in fiscal 2020. I mean, that is incredible growth rate in fiscal 20, and it continues at this growth at a very fast growth rate in the years ahead. And it's an incredibly lucrative business. 90% EBITDA margin in fiscal 19, 70% approximately in the years ahead. I mean, this is best of breed type margins, best of breed type growth. This is like the top 1% of type company financials that you, you'll see from an investor career, in my opinion. And it's, it's cr pretty incredible that over the next four years, they're effectively expecting to grow by 4x in three years. I mean, that's, this, is, this is a very interesting story. And so what are my thoughts about valuation when I'm looking at this? You know, currently trades a little around $12 per share. Um, and management's effectively projecting $71 million in profits in fiscal 21. And so when I'm looking at that, I, I see, you know, around 12 bucks a share. That implies around $1.3 billion market cap. That would imply a little under 20 times uh, earnings multiple for a company that's growing 100% plus. So this is an exceptional setup. Like this is a hyper growth, extremely profitable for a best of breed type company. But it makes me wonder, like you don't, you don't see companies growing at 100% trade at sub 20 times multiples. Like you'll, you'll, see, you'll see companies growing at 100% trade at 20 times sales. And you know, in, in fairness, I've, my, my, my most recent purchase is a stock, and this is for Unrivaled Investing Journey subscribers, where it's like, yeah, I, I, it's similar setup. Like it's growing super fast, um, and I, I like, you know, I like the financials and the valuations also compelling like that. But that's where the story starts to diverge. We're here. I'm looking at this, and it makes me wonder, like, am I dreaming? Is this too good to be true? Like, let's let's stop for a second. Like, er, like I, I did a high level overview of what they're doing and the opportunity that they're tapping into. But let's dig a little bit more into the setup. So first of all, why did they do this deal with Netfin Acquisition Corp? You know, you have this company that's growing at 100, 200 plus percent a year, and it's profitable. It's self-financing. If I'm, if you're, imagine that you're a business owner of a company that's self-financing. You don't need outside capital. You are profitable, and you're growing very quickly. I.e., the longer you can bootstrap, the longer you're going to get this valuation growth because the company's growing at a good clip. So why do the deal in the first place? So I'm, I'm looking at this and the deal is you get 257 million in cash and then the majority of it goes to the balance sheet. The rest goes to shareholders and transaction fees. I mean, this is pretty bizarre to me. Like for 257 million, they gave up 40% of the company, nearly 40% of the company. That's crazy. I mean, at a crazy low valuation. So either management is incompetent when it comes to dealing with the valuation of their stock, or they, they have a good friendship with Netfin founders. And they just wanted to do a deal. Like I'm looking at this and I'm like, why do a deal if you're growing at 200% and yourself, you don't need the capital. You don't need 179 million on the balance sheet if you're growing hyper fast. This is supposed to be an asset light -like business. Trust but verify. So when did they launch Kratos? You know, this platform is doing 10 billion in trade volume. That's what they're they're saying that they're going to do. Here it is, 10 billion in, in trade and trade finance volume in fiscal 20. 
So when did they launch Kratos? And Triteris was founded in 2018. Kratos, this platform enabling trade finance, was launched in June 2019. So less than two years to build a $1 billion company and one year for a $10 billion volume platform. And I, you know, I got to ask YouTube viewers like, man, what are you doing with your life? Like, how come you haven't built a $10 billion, you know, platform in, in a year or a billion dollar company in two years? Seriously, like you guys are a bunch of slackers. Um, or you could say like, what? How, how is this possible? Like, maybe, maybe, you know what? I bet management has a good reason why this is possible. And so they say that the reason why they scaled so fast is the CEO also owned this trading company and called Rhodium Resources that referred a bunch of customers their way and maybe presumably competitors to Rhodium Resources. Like, why would they know all these other players that would all of a sudden switch to their platform? Oh, it's because they're enabling this business. Anywho, it's like, it starts getting confusing to me. Like, why also they, they oh. so Rhodium Resources, they leveraged a company that the CEO also owned that does the trading side with the company that the CEO, this this tech platform that the CEO is also doing to sort of get other customers onto their platform. So they had one like core customer, Rhodium, and that's how they've been bringing on customers to grow so fast and get like $10 billion in volume. Okay, so now I wanna know more about one, the CEO's background and two, Rhodium. And so when I look at the CEO, Srinivas uh, Koneru, what's his background? And he previously set up Rhodium in 2012 Okay, so that's a few years. And before that, the language they use is he exited Exava, an IT, and you can see the exact detail here, um, an IT dev and services company in 2010, where he grew revenue from zero to over 80 million. They, it's sort of non-specific on the job title, but I'd love to learn more about Exava, this, this IT development and services company that he exited in 2010. I'd love to learn more about this. And here it is, these are the Glassdoor reviews for Exiva, which, I mean, this is pretty damning, um, where they're claiming it's an illegitimate company, it may well be a glorified Ponzi scheme that has somehow avoided lawsuits from unpaid companies and consultants. Um, this company is hurting society by literally stealing money from investors in order for the owners to pay to pack a fat paycheck. I mean, geez, I thought, thought some of my YouTube reviews were, were harsh. I mean, this is... This is a really harsh review from Glassdoor saying, calling it effectively a fraud. But keep in mind, this is from December 2012, whereas the CEO is claiming he got out of it in 2010. I don't know any of the details because they haven't provided like who they're selling to and what happened to the company since then. Um, but here's another review also after that period where they claim it was a horrible experience. The company was smoke and mirrors. So, I mean, once again, in fairness, these reviews are after the CEO left. But that's a pretty that's a pretty ugly picture. I, I'm very curious what CEO they're talking about in these reviews, um, because if they're talking about him, then there's clearly this sort of mismatch of, of the periods. So then in December, Rhodium, this core customer, so this is my second question, Rhodium, this core customer that the CEO also owns, filed for bankruptcy in Singapore. So this was the core customer that brought on all this other business. And management claims that by now they've grown with enough outside customers referred by Rhodium so that Rhodium is less than 10% of total revenues. And I'm thinking like, wait a second, how is this even possible? It's not like you're, you're getting $10 billion in trade finance and you earlier said your average loan was sub $2 million. That means you must have a bonanza of customers that you're onboarding. Like that, that just strikes me as really hard to do, really hard to achieve, all from what started off as this one, you know, core partner that the, the CEO also owned. Um, and management also claims that the reason why Rhodium is facing bankruptcy or had to go through the bankruptcy court in Singapore is because of COVID resulting in several commodity buyers, which is Rhodium's customers, asking for extensions of payments and that they sort of had a unwielding or un you know, a, a lender that's not willing to sort of be flexible in terms of payments. So not surprising, once this news came out that Rhodium, you know, was in bankruptcy courts in Singapore, the stock went on a crazy ride where it dropped like 40% in a few days, and it's largely recovered a lot since then. Now, what are my thoughts looking at this? I think the Godfather, when I'm looking at this, you know, there's this great scene 
with with Michael Corleone, and he approaches Mo Green about taking over his casino. As Michael, as as Mo Green's, you know, this is Mo Green is his casino loses money, and Michael Corleone's like, "Look, I'd, I'd like to buy your casino." And he goes, "Look, it's it's unprofitable. I th- I think I can do better." And he goes, "You think I'm skimming off the top, Mike?" And Michael Corleone, you know, the, the Godfather, he responds. He shakes his head and he goes, "You're unlucky." And so when I when I see Srinivas, maybe he's just unlucky. Like, I I don't know what's going on here, but to have those sorts of terrible exit of reviews, to have Rhodium bankruptcy all in short period, and then to really build, how do you build a platform $10 billion in volume one year from launch, two years after you founded the company? You know, I'm, I'm looking at this, and then why did you even, you know, sell 40% of the company if if you don't need to? So I'm, I'm looking at this like strike one's the X of reviews, the Rhodium bankruptcy strike two. You know, in baseball, you need three strikes, but this ain't baseball. This is unrivaled investing. So this this is a pass for me. This is this is just too hard for me. Um, I want to call out the Bear Cave. Uh, I I really enjoyed you know some of their the, the the report that they put out on Triterrace where they called out all these other things that struck struck them as weird and equally weird for me as well. So I I look at this and there are just too many weird things like the as I just mentioned you know like selling forty percent of your company at a ridiculously cheap valuation. Um, given their growth, um, the the ex of reviews, the rhodium bankruptcy, and, and just it doesn't seem feasible, um, you know, to grow ten billion dollars volume. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, you know, while Triterra seems like a very exciting story, uh, there's there's simply just been too many warnings for me as a potential investor. So I it's it's not going to be part of my journey. Um, but yeah, if the company checks out, this could be up hundreds of percent over time. If it doesn't check out and they're unlucky or something worse, then investors are for in for quite a bumpy ride. So I personally try to look for a better risk reward uh, where I can say, hey, I think there's 100% upside. I see other investors that I respect also that have that have a history of investing in quality companies getting in. So and there's there's a setup like that that you know I, I unrivaled investing journey subscribers know about where I, I called it as my potential multi-bagger for January 2021, where I think it has potentially 5x upside. Um, so so I, I'd rather focus on things like that than something like this, where it's just like, this is so weird. There's so many red flags. Why are you selling at this cheap valuation? Um, yeah, so it's it strikes me as weird. Um, but if you want to follow my personal journey on what am I doing, you go to unrivaledinvesting.com, click on journey. You can see what I buy, what I sell, what I hold exclusive content a lot of videos i'll do an exclusive follow-up on content there's an educational series uh and my aim with this journey is to try to find one potential multi-bagger each month and i let journey subscribers learn know about that and you can see all my exclusive content right now because i'll post a catalog of content so you can see everything there um to, to click on it if, you, if you're interested in learning more about it and finding just one potential multi-bagger one potential multi-bagger can change your personal life journey so if you're interested in following my journey to try to find these potential multi-baggers go to unrivaled investing Dot com click on journey and if you enjoyed learning about triteras trit stock learning about the setup how there's a lot of potential upside if it all checks out but simply there's too many red flags for me personally if you enjoyed this make sure you subscribe if you're already a subscriber i appreciate that thumbs up and thank you so much for watching